This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 767, recorded on June 10th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Well, Daniel, you got another wide-body aircraft, 767. <laughs> That's that's what I was hoping. So I'm I'm happy with that. You know, you got to take what you can. What what's the biggest aircraft? Do we know? Do we? Uh, is it Allen? We need Allen to be know. It's the Alan. biggest aircraft ever. I don't know. I have no idea. You but, know, when I was a kid, I actually I flew as a kid. Um, but uh, I preferred gliders. Uh, I've always been that <laughs> like sailing gliders. You know, and it's just something you know amazing about being up there without an engine, and then yeah, yeah. you know catching the thermals spiraling up. And uh, yeah, the amazing. gliding looks great, but I don't want to do it. I'm good. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, let's start with our quotation. Um, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. And that's uh, Paul Farmer. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with Paul Farmer. He's actually uh, the co-founder and chief strategist of Partners in Health, which is a um, pretty significant international nonprofit organization um, that's existed since the 1980s, um, providing healthcare services, um, but also, um, you know, involved in research and advocacy. Um, and I, I have to admit, my first exposure to Paul Farmer was reading uh, the book Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. Um, and I, that, that's really a must read for, um, I was going to say for people going into global health, but I'm just going to say it's a, it's a must read, um, just a really, um, impressive, inspiring individual. Um, and really, you know, my wife and I were actually talking about Paul Farmer the other night, just about how he truly lives, um, this message. Um, he, he really treats every human being, um, as if they're the most important person in the world. Um, my wife says that she and I are a little too tribal. Our, our kids come first and everyone else second. Um, for Paul, I think he treats everyone like they're his son, his daughter. So um, I think as we're going into the next phase, um, we're going to have to realize um, that uh, the, the developed um, nations, the nations with uh, more resources really need to be there for, for everyone. Um, you know, you, you can't have J&J vaccines expiring uh, while people are still dying in uh, many parts of the world without access. So I thought I would start with that as our quotation. Um, but let me give an update. Uh, today was a, a milestone um, at the two hospitals where I uh, spent my um, morning, earlier part of the day, uh, not a single COVID case, not a single active COVID case in either hospital. Um, you know, over at some of the other hospitals, there are still some COVID cases, but um, boy, um, COVID has fallen off a cliff here in my immediate area. Um, you know, the weather's getting better. Uh, there's a combination of vaccines and also, boy, a bunch of people got infected already. So we really have things going in the right direction. And um, what I'm going to start with is actually we, we have learned a lot. So we have a lot of um, evidence-based um, recommendations now, which really makes my world a lot better. Uh, so I was just going to start with sort of the executive summary of the ID Society of America's guidelines, uh, just what they're recommending for and against. But I'm going to give a little context. Um, so there's... Um, there's 19 recommendations. Some of them are kind of, um, you know, combinations, so to speak. So recommendation number one, hydroxychloroquine against. Um, recommendation two, uh, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, also against. Uh, not using lopinavir, azithromycin, not using lopinavir, ritonavir. The next recommendation four and five, dexamethasone, not in the outpatient, um, but recommended in the inpatient um, setting if a person has a oxygen saturation less than 94%. Recommendation seven, um, for those hospitalized patients with progressive severe COVID-19 with elevated markers of systemic inflammation, escalation in that oxygen requirement, uh, suggesting the use of tocilizumab, right, the IL-6 uh, receptor blocker. Among patients 
hospitalized with COVID-19 recommending against convalescent plasma. Um, as far as the ambulatory patients, um, want to get some more studies on that, but not, not just doing it um, as a standard. Remdesivir, um, falling into that same criteria, the hospitalized patient less than 94%. But if that patient actually is more severe, invasive ventilation, recommending against it, people actually do worse. So timing, uh, recurrent theme really matters here. Um, and recommending five days, not 10. So five days across the board, um, if you're going to be using remdesivir, again, only in the right patient. Jumping to famotidine, uh, pepsid, um, you know, those antacids that are going to cure your COVID, recommending against famotidine. Um, then we get into our monoclonals. Um, and actually now the ID um, Society of America um, is recommending, they've been doing this for a little while, but they are recommending um, using combination um, monoclonals, such as the bam bam atesimumab in areas with appropriate susceptibilities or the Regeneron cocktail, uh, Cassie imdevimab, um, but not monotherapy with bam um, And they haven't quite added the, the VIR GSK monoclonal, which is our third, uh, you know, EUA approach. What about baritacitinib, right? Um, we haven't really talked too much about that. Um, this is actually a therapy that is in there as a recommendation, um, but as um, people have probably noticed, really hasn't gotten a lot of um, uptake. Uh, limited evidence that maybe it shortens hospital stay by about a day, um, but it's not something a lot of us are particularly comfortable using, but it just, I will give it some uh, mention there. No one's complete without a mention of ivermectin, right? So we are going to return to ivermectin, <laughs> um, but basically they're, they're saying at this point, we still need clinical trials. This isn't something that should be used outside of clinical trials. We need those clinical trials, um, but we will get back to ivermectin. Um, um, okay, children and COVID, as I like to say, children are at low risk, but they're not at no risk. And I think that I think that's reasonable. I think that's um, accurate. Someone recently suggested to me that now that we're aware that every year um, over 100 children here in the U.S. die from flu, perhaps now people will be more motivated to get their children and themselves vaccinated. I'll never comprehend the lesson warm comments I get when I talk about children and, uh, and COVID here. But I actually, uh, we are actually pointing out some things that maybe people didn't realize. I know early on people said, oh, we've, we've been comfortable with 100 children dying every year. I'm not comfortable with 100 children dying every year of the flu. And I'm certainly not comfortable with three to 500 children having died of COVID. You know, I've been working with a lot of schools, summer programs, sporting programs, businesses, trying to translate this science into safe mitigation practices um, uh, really for um, over a year now. Um, and, and I do like to reinforce that um, in all these different uh, settings where I've um, offered free advice, right? Um, sometimes it wasn't free, actually. I think the NHL is supposed to send me a paycheck at some point, um, but we haven't had any. Uh, we haven't had any transmission. This is something that can be done safely, but as I always point out, it's also something that can be done unsafely. So more from the CDC MMWR, and this article got quite a bit of press. Hospitalization of adolescents aged 12 to 17 um, with laboratory confirmed COVID-19, um, COVID net 14 states. March 1st, 2020, April 24, 2021. Um, and this came out as an early release. Um, and the authors reported that COVID-19 adolescent hospitalization rates um, peaked at 2.1 per 100,000 in early January. Then we're headed in the right direction with this declining to 0 0.6 um, in mid-March. However, in April 2021, the rate more than doubled up to 1.3 per 100,000. Um, among hospitalized adolescents, nearly one third um, were admitted to the ICU um, and 5% um, required invasive mechanical ventilation. Um, no associated deaths were reported during this period of time. A couple things I wanna say about this. Um, you know, th th this is accurate, what they said is true, um, but a doubling from 0 0.6 per 100,000 up to 1.3 per 100,000, um, the, the numbers are still low. Um, you know, in my mind, a single preventable death or hospitalization is is one too many. Um, I already mentioned the comparator to the um, to the the flu deaths that we see, um, but this continues to be low. Um, and actually, it looks like it's dropping. Right, look at the number of cases; um, it's dropping all across the board. So. Um, 
I think we've learned that the fact that masks and social isolation and many other aspects of the pandemic um, have had a very negative impact on our children. Um, so a lot of discussion now and reasonable um, about moving forward now that the rates are um, very low in a lot of our populations and also um, that we're rolling out expanding our vaccination effort. So um, I want to say things look good relative to our children. Things look really good relative to the summer and next fall. Pre-exposure period transmission. Um, you know, this remains a hot topic. Um, and, you know, and, and I, I think rightfully so. Um, I recently was uh, emailing a bit with uh, Michael Minna. I think some of our listeners know him of the, the lick a stick. Um, and just talking about how, um, you know, for science communication, the concept um, of aerosol and airborne has been quite difficult. Um, you know, we say, hey, one in 10,000 cases are um, attributable to contact. So, oh my gosh, that means COVID is, is contact transmission. Well, it is, but it is usually not in that situation. Um, we've talked about the number of cases that occur um, within the three to six feet in close contact. Um, but we've also clearly discussed that there are a number of cases that occur even when you're outside those six feet. And we've talked about the role of ventilation improvements where you're clearly beyond that six feet, um, improving um, the risk, reducing the risk of, of transmission. So um, hopefully we will get a little better um, better language that we will have less confusion and controversy and we can really focus on what's important, which is keeping people safe and uh, communicating the essential messages on how to do that. Why, why are we talking about Michael Amina? He actually just published another paper um, and this was out of his group, Estimating Epidemiological Dynamics from Cross-Sectional Viral Load Distributions. Um, and this was published in Science. Um, and the authors suggest that the population distribution of viral loads observed in the form of CT values, right? The cycle threshold values um, that you get from the PCR testing um, actually changes during a pandemic. And they argue that the CT values, even from limited numbers of random samples, um, can provide estimates of an epidemic's trajectory, right? So they're trying to say, this might be a tool we can use, um, you know, should we see the next pandemic or even in this pandemic? They go on to demonstrate that combining data from multiple samples can improve the precision and robustness of this estimation. Um, and they looked at CT values from surveillance conducted during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic in a variety of settings. Um, and they offer alternative approach, uh, approaches for real-time estimates of the epidemic trajectories um, for this outbreak management based on these um, values. Um, what they're really trying to suggest um, is they bring up the observed CT values and the fact that they have varied over the course of the pandemic and saying you do not need to invoke fitness changes, um, necessarily genetic changes in the virus. Um, there actually can be a trajectory um, of the pandemic. Um, so this is, I have to say, it is a complicated paper, um, but it is worth reading. So we'll, we'll get it up there on our website. Um, and I'm going to suggest again that sharing this information, um, I think it should be a standard part of every PCR report, whether it's positive or negative, but also at what level it's positive or negative. Um, the more this information is out there and shared, um, I, I think we're all... Um, smart enough, educated enough that we can handle that information um, and try to make uh, something of it. Active vaccination, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate and vaccines are how this pandemic um, ends. And I'm gonna try to throw some, um, some stories in here. Um, you know, we, we, I was, I was throw in these stories where, where a uh, clinician has maybe not uh, managed a patient as, as best um, as they might have. And, and I do that as a, um, as a way of uh, teaching, sort of bringing out people say, oh, we'd never do that. And hopefully that sticks in their minds. Um, but I do, I get a lot of communication from a lot of really, um, I'm going to say really brilliant, really hardworking um, primary care clinicians across the country um, that are not making these mistakes. So um, I really applaud. This has been a really tough 18 months and a lot of, um, say, a lot of our TWIV listeners, a lot of physicians out there are really putting in those extra hours and staying up to date. Um, we're still seeing these individuals come in. I described an individual last uh, week. Um, I mentioned that the two hospitals I went to today had no COVID, uh, but my partner, Anuja Lee, just admitted a uh, woman, late 50s, diabetic, um, not vaccinated. Uh, she was exposed because her dad was ill. Um, also, 
um, in the hospital, sort of missed the window for vaccine, missed the window for the monoclonals. Um, so uh, I think that we've got to keep hammering on this. Um, you know, this is a the Hail Mary, as some people like to say, for the unvaccinated. Let's talk about not only vaccines, but what about prior infection? Um, so there was a paper, Incidence of SARS-CoV-2 Infection According to Baseline Antibody Status in Staff and Residents of 100 Long-Term Care Facilities. Um, Vivaldi, a prospective cohort study. Um, and this was published in the Lancet Healthy Longevity Journal. Now, I do not su subscribe to this journal, full disclosure, but perhaps I should. Um, I mean, who does not want healthy longevity? Um, but this was a prospective cohort study of SARS-CoV-2 infection in staff, um, less than 65 years of age, interesting enough, um, and the residents were all over age 65. Um, and they looked at 100 long-term care facilities in England between October 1st, 2020, and February 1st, 2021. Now that sounds like a lot, right? But at the end of the day, um, they only ended up looking at 682 residents from 86 of the long-term care facilities um, and 1,429 staff members from 97 long-term care facilities. Um, just, you know, who met criteria and who could be included. Um, at baseline, IgG antibodies to nuclear capsid were detected in 226 of the 682 residents, so about a third, and 408, so 29%, about a third of the 1,429 staff members. They then observed that 20% of the 456 residents who were antibody negative and included at baseline went on to have a positive PCR test um, compared with 2% of the 226 residents who were antibody positive at baseline. Um, what about the staff? 11% um, of the staff that were antibody at negative at the beginning went on to have a positive versus 2% of the staff who were antibody positive at baseline. Um, so they give us a uh, adjusted hazard ratio for the serology positive residents um, of 0 0.15 and for staff 0 0.39. Um, now, now what, what were sort of the interesting things about this study? Um, one was that um, this study had to be kind of um, impacted um, because we have the rapid rollout of vaccines in the long-term care facilities in England uh, starting December 8th. Um, so mixed in here is single dose vaccine protection in previously infected, and then the data seems a little bit less clear. Um, and this is gonna bring up what I think is important um, challenge for us going forward, trying to collect data about the impact of natural infection um, compared to vaccines, um, and also um, the issue that we're gonna come up to, um, what about variants? So there was a research letter, gonna hit you with another right in here in this section, assessment of SARS-CoV-2 reinfection in Lombardy, Italy, right? So now we're moving from the UK to Italy. Um, and here the, the authors are reporting on the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 um, primary infection and reinfection among individuals who during the first wave of the pandemic in Italy underwent diagnostic um, PCR testing. Um, and the results of this study suggested that patients who had recovered from SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, um, had a lower risk of reinfection um, and there appeared to be a protective um, effect um, out to about a year. Um, and the authors here uh, did comment that this observation all ended right before we started to see the SARS-CoV-2 um, variants enter um, Italy. Now there's a study that actually has gotten a lot of attention. So we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Um, and this was a preprint. Uh, so this is not peer reviewed and it, it needs some peer review. Um, necessity of COVID-19 vaccination in previously infected individuals. Um, so this preprint um, was a study looking at employees of the Cleveland Clinic Health System. Um, now, uh, fortunately, from a science standpoint, but unfortunately, from a public health standpoint, it did not look like there was great success in terms of vaccine uptake. Um, the, author, the authors reported that the majority of employees that had been previously infected did not get vaccinated, and only 59% of the other employees got vaccinated. So not, not a great job of, uh, of employees getting vaccinated out there at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, they also reported that 5% of their employees ended up getting infected with COVID-19 
prior to the start of this study. So, so far, not, not, not really uh, great stuff for the Cleveland Clinic here. Um, what they did is they, um, they performed a retrospective cohort study. Um, and what they obtained was a waiver of informed consent. So they, they did not need any of the employees to actually um, consent for their data to be used here. Um, they got a waiver of HIPAA authorization um, so that these researchers could um, go ahead and access all these employees' uh, personal health information and records. Um, and then the authors compared four groups. Um, so you have group one, these are previously infected, unvaccinated, previously infected, vaccinated, not previously infected, unvaccinated, and not previously infected, vaccinated. Um, and then they followed these individuals over five months. Um, and there's a plot. Um, it's a Simon Makuk plot. It looks a lot like those Kaplan-Meier curves where you see over time um, the rates of infection. And they really, um, it, it's sort of striking to the eyes that the only area where you're seeing significant rates of new infection are in the not previously infected, unvaccinated population. Now, the authors make several allowances. They do comment that their results are quite a bit different from um, a large study um, out of Denmark um, looking at, um, well, actually it was, it was a population of 4 million PCR tested individuals in Denmark study. So um, that paper assessment of protection against reinfection with SARS-CoV-2 among 4 million PCR tested individuals in Denmark in 2020, a population level observational study. Um, the authors commented that that study suggested only about an 80.5% reduction and only a 47.1% reduction in those over the age of 65. So they comment that their, um, their results um, in this preprint um, are quite a bit different, quite a bit more rosy and encouraging than we saw in that study. Um, their study also was only a five-month follow-up, right? So um, we sort of have this idea that you don't test people for the first three. So a lot of people have asked me about, was it really just a two-month follow-up? So um, you got to look at that in terms of the numbers. Um, and they also comment, I think this is really critical all across the board, it is not known how well these results will hold if or when some of the newer variants of concern become prominent. Um, so we're getting, we're getting, I think, encouraging information, um, you know, which we expected um, about a lower risk of being infected if you've been infected in the past. Um, but unfortunately, the data we're seeing now is the majority of infections now in the U.S. are not with the original variant. They're with the new variant. So we are in that world that was discussed here of newer variants. And that's the infections we're seeing. Um, it becomes a whole new question. We know the vaccines. We have better and better data um, on vaccine efficacy against variants. Um, we do not have as great data um, suggesting that people with prior infection are um, going to fare well with the new variants. Um, so I continue to um, recommend to my patients who've been previously infected that they go ahead um, with the vaccine. Now, this is going to be a sort of a, a tricky one here. I, I didn't realize how complicated this was, but what do we as clinicians do now when people come from overseas and they got some sort of vaccine outside the U.S.? How do we handle that? Um, well, fortunately, thanks, the CDC has given us a playbook on how to do this. And uh, if you go to the CDC, they have a section um, where they basically talk about what to do for a person who received a COVID-19 vaccine outside the U.S. And they break this down into really, I'm going to say, three basic categories. But this is coming up. I get, I get calls from clinicians all the time. So I'm going to send them to this TWIV and the answers will be here. But let's take category number one. This is a person who has received all the recommended doses of a COVID-19 vaccine that is listed for emergency use by the WHO. What do we do? Nothing. We consider them vaccinated. This is not just restricted to the FDA. Uh, three that we have, these are any of those vaccines on the WHO list, which I will go through. Scenario number two, the person has not gotten all the doses, um, but they did start um, on one of these series of what's considered a WHO approved vaccine. Um, you go ahead in that case and just offer them to the opportunity to complete one of our FDA authorized COVID-19 vaccine series. So let's hit a little scenarios here. Let's say they got a Moderna, a Pfizer overseas. You can give them that second Moderna or Pfizer dose here in the US considered completed. What if they got an AstraZeneca um, overseas? Um, 
you can then give them a two dose of the mRNA, or you can give them a J and J. So um, little subtlety there. What if they received a vaccine that you've never heard of that is not on the WHO list? So they come and they said, you know what? I got my Covaxin inactivated vaccine produced by Bharat Biotech in India. What do you do? Um, in that case, we just go ahead. We treat them as if they were unvaccinated, and we just recommend going ahead um, with an FDA authorized COVID-19 vaccine series. So those are our three scenarios here. Um, a little subtlety, you want to wait at least 28 days after that last dose of a vaccine that is not on the WHO list. Um, and what are the current vaccines on that list as of May 13th, when it was last updated? Um, that's the Pfizer BioNTech, the AstraZeneca, the J&J, &J, Moderna, Sinopharm, and Sinovac. Um, questions, go to the CDC website. All right. The period of detectable viral replication, the viral symptom phase, the time for monitoring and monoclonals. And as I like to say, where you get your test is where you should be able to get your monoclonals. Um, so we had some exciting news. Um, on June 4th, Regenera announced that the FDA authorized lower 1,200 milligram intravenous and subcutaneous dose um, Regen Cove. So that's the Casavirivimab and the Imdevimab antibody cocktail. Um, to treat patients with COVID-19. Um, and it was the subcutaneous part that got me the most excited because um, this means we can really start expanding access to these impressive medications. Um, I know a lot of the, the hospitals, right, are going to sort of stick with what they've got. A lot of them I know in the New York area have switched over to Regeneron, um, but this is potentially a chance for those urgent care, some of those primary care sites um, to go ahead. Um, it's a little bit, you know, harder than I wish it was. It, it is a smaller volume, but it's still four shots, um, but that's a lot less than um, having to uh, get something out of the freezer, set up an IV. Um, so uh, I think that that's great. Um, all right. So I'm going to throw a little story. I'll call this missed opportunity. Um, and this is, this is a woman that we're um, currently taking care of. I sort of alluded a woman in her late fifties, carrying a little bit of extra weight, um, diabetes, just recently diagnosed with COVID. This is not the woman admitted this morning. Um, she was unvaccinated, um, sort of part of a group of individuals who were also unvaccinated, and that was the exposure. Um, at the time of diagnosis, monoclonals were not offered. Um, and I think I, um, I told a little bit about how this woman ended up doing poorly. Um, so just, just kind of keep this in mind. Um, she ended up saying like, I don't want to expose my family. Um, and ended up in the hospital. Um, unfortunately, now she's on a ventilator. So uh, just keep in mind, if you decide not to get vaccinated, you can still get monoclonals. An article, co-infections, secondary infections, and antimicrobial use in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 during the first pandemic wave um, from the ISARIC. WHO CCP UK study. This is a multi-center prospective cohort study published in the Lancet Microbe. Um, and I have to say, when I read this paper, it, it made me sad. Um, really what they, um, what they observed was that 85.2% um, of patients with COVID require, ended up receiving, they did not require, but they ended up receiving one or more um, antimicrobials, antibiotics at some point during their admission. Um, and there was a lot of use of broad spectrum agents, a lot of use of carbapenems um, rather than the carbapenem sparing alternative. So really using those top shelf restricted antibiotics in the context of a viral illness. All right, ivermectin, yet another paper on ivermectin. Um, and this one was published in the journal Viruses. Um, and this was effects of a single dose of ivermectin on viral and clinical outcomes in asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infected subjects, a pilot clinical trial in Lebanon. Um, this was a randomized controlled trial um, conducted in 100 asymptomatic subjects in Lebanon that had tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, five days after having come in contact with a, um, with a suspected or positive case. So um, we really had good timing here. Um, this is looking at early treatment. Um, the authors reported that at baseline, the two groups had similar 
viral loads as assessed by CT values. Um, so 15.13 versus 14.2. Um, the treatment group received a single dose of ivermectin. So this is a single dose of ivermectin um, adjusted by weight. Um, they also received what was what is the standard of care in Lebanon, which is zinc and vitamin C as well. Um, and the authors reported uh, two, two findings. Um, at 72 hours after the regimen was started, the increase in CT values was significantly higher in the ivermectin than the control group. So higher CT values, lower viral load. Um, in the ivermectin group, the CT increased from 15 to 30 compared to the control group where it only went from 14 to 18.96. Um, moreover, uh, more subjects in the control group uh, developed symptoms. 6% um, of the control population required hospitalization. Nobody in the ivermectin treated group um, required hospitalization. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to muse a little bit on this here um, as uh, and people should listen to the uh, the TWIV that came right before this uh, this uh, big body airplane episode uh, with David Fagenbaum. I mean, David, David's great. David's another one of these like Paul Far Paul Farmer um, type guys. who just really what what a just amazing story, right, of a man who has done so much with so many challenges. Um, and he's he's really said, listen, um, you know, ivermectin is something that we do not know the answer to, right? We have some studies that are positive. We have some studies that are negative. Um, we, don't, we don't have enough data on ivermectin where I think it's, it's reasonable to say that, oh my gosh, withholding ivermectin is a crime against humanity. Um, a crime against humanity is that we have not done um, the really good trials that we need to do um, to help us in this realm. So we're all fingers crossed that Active 6, in addition to inhaled steroids, um, fluvoxamine, um, maybe ivermectin will be in there because one of the issues um, is that people are using this widely throughout the world, probably second only to hydroxychloroquine, which unfortunately some people are still using um, and they should stop that. Um, and we need to know either way with a really good trial so that um, clinicians, patients can make decisions about whether or not this is um, something that should be included in the treatment. All right, early inflammatory phase. Um, did we talk about aspirin before? Well, aspirin, we finally got the recovery data on aspirin. Um, and aspirin um, does not seem to be making a difference. So the aspirin in patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19 recovery, a randomized control open label platform trial. Uh, this was posted as a preprint. Um, I think our, all our listeners are familiar with the big UK recovery trial. Um, basically, end of the day, aspirin was not associated with reduction in 28-day mortality or in the risk of progressing to invasive mechanical ventilation or death. Um, so, this is basically 150 milligrams of aspirin once per day um, versus standard care without that um, and not, not showing a benefit here. So um, I'm going to just close quickly with a mention of long COVID. Um, we're trying to find what are the centers of excellence. We're trying to establish um, some definitions of what, what are excellent outcomes. Um, so hopefully we can get uh, patients, fortunately a growing number of patients into those centers. Um, and we are going to continue to support Femeric. Um, so May, June, and July, all donations made to Parasites Without Borders um, will be doubled. We're hoping to get up to $40,000 to support Femeric. So thank you very much. Time for some emails for Daniel. If you want to send one in, daniel at microbe.tv. Patty writes, any data uh, and or I would like to know your thoughts on the effectiveness of the Pfizer COVID vaccine on patients who receive intravenous or crevice to modulate multiple sclerosis symptoms. Okay. So I've actually gotten um, a lot of questions. Actually, a uh Ocrevus is one of the one of the culprits that um, often triggers people to reach out to me. Um, and what is Ocrevus for our listeners? So this is a, a B cell and plasma cell depleting therapy. So this uh, targets CD20. So it's going to get rid of your B cells, your plasma cells. Um, basically, you're going to get rid of those antibody producing cells, really more of a B cell, right? You're going to lose your CD20 when you differentiate to plasma cells. But when someone gets this, they have very few B cells they get the vaccine. If you go ahead and check a anti-spike antibody serology, it's going to be negative. Just, just, to, just to say um, um, the B cells are not there to make those antibodies. So you're relying on a T cell response. Well, what about that T cell response? Um, I heard there's a T cell test, this T detect by adaptive. 
the way that that is set up, the algorithm they use is good for detecting natural infection. It is not yet calibrated uh, to give us a T cell correlate of immunity. So in these individuals, blood testing is not going to be helpful. Um, we are concerned, right, that these people have gotten these therapies, that they're not getting um, the B cell serology response. We hope that we're just relying on T cells. Um, and we do not know the answer to this. There certainly are people out there giving extra doses of vaccines. I think we need to study this just like everything else. Um, what we are not seeing, and I think this is reassuring, we are not seeing these patients ending up in the hospital, right? I'm not seeing patients who got a cre uh, okay. Crevis. I'm not seeing patients on methotrexate. I'm not seeing lots of renal transplant or other transplant patients who got vaccinated ending up in the hospital. So despite a lack of this serological support, we're not seeing um, the breakthrough that would be as concerning as people might think in these populations. So I'm a bit reassured um, in these populations. I'm also reassured that the level of the virus is going down. But what is the best way to protect these individuals? It's for everyone else to get vaccinated. Christy from Seattle writes, is it possible for the COVID vaccine Pfizer to cause an allergy such as cat grass, et cetera, to develop? A week after my partner got the second shot, he started getting itchy eyes and sneezing around our cats that we've had for three years. Obviously, there are plenty of coincidental conditions, as you've talked about on the show, and this still consequence is far better than getting COVID. If possible, why would this happen? Yeah, so this one you're going to have trouble um, doing much of a search on, right? Because everyone's all worried about the anaphylaxis. Um, I, I am not sure that there's a relationship here. Uh, this has been a particularly bad allergy season. Um, I have to say, I never had allergies before this season. Oh my gosh, I just got COVID shots. So maybe it's, no, no, I'm joking. Um, I don't think there's a connection here. I just think this is a really bad um, allergen season. Um, the world's in a slightly better place with um, how much uh, carbon mitigation, how much reduction in travel and the rest. Um, we may just be seeing lots of things blooming. Um, the cat connection, I'm not sure. Joseph writes, in preparing for reopening a program for seniors, I was asked by my wife to review their reopening policy. Their program provides continuing educational and recreational programming for seniors. Their program will require COVID, virus vac COVID vaccination to attend the program. The average age of the participants is about 80 years old. Given their age, the possible high-risk medical conditions of these seniors, would you still recommend that the staff and participants still mask after vaccination. Yeah, you know, this this is a tough one. We've we've really doubled down on, boy, those vaccines really make a big difference. But, you know, I, I think that you've got to make individual decisions here. If you're over 80, if you have a number of medical problems, I think we've talked about people on different medications. Um, that's when, if you, if you feel comfortable continuing to wear a mask, um, it is a reasonable thing to do. Um, we're still not through this pandemic. Um, we're only learning about um, the impact of the vaccines on different variants. Everyone is 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 unique as far as their um, ability to respond to the vaccines, particularly once they get above the age of 80. Um, so I, I see no problem um, continuing with masks. And I point out when I go to the gym, um, I am a robust, healthy individual on no medications with no medical problems in my 50s. I still wear a mask. Um, I don't think there's a problem with continuing to have extra levels of safety. And from Stacy. I'm a psychologist in private practice. I have several patients prescribed either atypical antipsychotics or neuroleptic antipsychotic medication for bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, borderline personality disorder, and schizophrenia. Their medications include lithium, uh, clopazine, olanzapine, lamotrigine. Many have expressed concerns about possible negative interactions between COVID vaccine and their psychiatric medication. Several concerns relate to possible toxicity, decrease in efficacy of psychotropics and side effects. One patient mentioned a fear about the COVID vaccine causing a drop in white blood cells. I would like to know if there is any evidence to suggest patients on psychotropic medication should not get vaccinated and or what resources, research, et cetera, are available that I can access to help assure my folks that all the COVID vaccines are safe and effective for individuals with serious mental illness. Yeah, so I'm going to say um, you can feel very reassured here. Um, there, There's a very robust reporting system, right? Hundreds of millions, over 300 million doses of COVID vaccines have been given in the United States. We have a robust reporting system. Um, any of the concerns, you hear about them. You hear about them in the popular press. Um, we are really good at um, watching for these things. We are not seeing any um, issues in this population, not seeing any issues with these medications. Um, if there's an issue, we're going to hear about it, even if it's something as rare as one in 
10 or 20,000, boom, we're going to see that come up on our um, adverse reporting systems. I'm going to say very comfortably that uh, this is a safe thing to do. Being vaccinated is so much safer than not being vaccinated for these individuals. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 66 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you so much. And everyone be safe. Thank you.